Welcome everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on merger and acquisitions and where theory meets practice. My name is Sherry Moore. I'm part of the business development team here at SMU Cox Executive Education. And with me today is Dr. Shane Goodwin. I'm gonna introduce him in just a minute, but before we get started, I'm gonna talk through what we're gonna cover in the next hour. Um, we're gonna cover an overview of SMU Cox. We're also gonna cover a little bit more on the um, introduction of the program, mergers and acquisitions. Then we're gonna move into the registration process and how you would register with us. We're gonna talk about the key contacts that are in the program. And then we are also gonna cover some Q&A at the end. And I also wanted to mention at this point, if you would all please um, jump into the chat window and send us your questions. And I'll be happy to read those out as we go along through the session, if appropriate, to the timing of what we're covering. Um, and then if not, we will cover them for sure at the end. So let me step into the overview of SMU Cox. Um, we, have been, we are now celebrating our 100th year of business education. Um, we did that in, in uh, February 20th of 2020. Uh, we have been an integral part of this business community. We have proven instructors. We have true and tested content with a commitment to leadership development and to performance. We also have collaborative working methods with companies and individuals to assure success. And we have made a high value investment in our leadership development. So when you think about SMU Cox and what's different about our approach, we develop and inspire leaders that make a difference in the world. And we really focus on import incorporating principles and techniques of learning that include reflection and active participation, sharing of experiences, a variety of learning methods, and all of our instructors have credibility, humility, and respect. So when we talk to participants about why they choose SMU Cox for a program, this is what we hear back. That we have expert and engaging faculty who are leaders in their field. They're relevant content based on the, lead, on the latest research. You walk away with immediate innovative tools that you can put to work today. It's a collaborative and networking environment with diverse colleagues, and we have a safe and challenging environment to think and to test new ideas. So at this point, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Goodwin and give you a little bit of background on um, his, his experience with SMU. Dr. Goodwin is the Associate Dean of Graduate Programs and Executive Education and a Professor of Practice at the Cox School of Business. He also leads the Applied Corporate Governance Institute at the Center for Global Enterprise. And prior to joining SMU, Dr. Goodwin was a senior fellow and the director of the Richard Paul Richmond Center for Business Law and Public Policy at Columbia University. And he served as a senior fellow at the Harvard Law School Program on Corporate Governance and Financial Regulation and as a postdoctorate fellow of Business Economics at Harvard Business School. Dr. Goodwin has 25 years of M&A corporate finance experience with Goldman Sachs and Citigroup, Wells Fargo, and Donaldson, Lufkin, and Jinrette. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Goodwin and have him start discussing the program, kicking it off with his first question. Um, if most M&A de uh, details fail, then how do you beat the odds with your first or your next transaction? Great. Well, thanks, Sherry. I truly appreciate that. Uh, welcome, everyone, and uh, I'm glad you could join us here this afternoon or morning, wherever you are. Um, well, first of all, this is a, uh, always a very exciting time uh, for me. I was very fortunate to spend, as Sherry said, uh, my, really my professional career, my corporate career, working on mergers and acquisitions. And one of the things that comes up quite often is, and we read about it in the press all the time, is that most deals fail. Um, they're headline grabbing uh, as far as why do people engage in M&A since most of them usually fail. So it's a very good question because there are a lot of academic studies and quite frankly, many of you even on this call probably know there are a lot of anecdotal uh, examples of things that you've been around other transactions that probably did not work out very well. So why do people keep doing it if it uh, ultimately shows so much failure? Well, because there are a lot of deals, quite frankly, that uh, do work extremely well. And obviously, most people who are transaction oriented or people who are looking for inorganic growth opportunities tend to not think that they're going to be the ones to be 
unsuccessful. That's really not the mindset of someone doing that. But the ones that uh, use M&A as a strategic advantage, these are companies that are more successful, the companies that are more successful at M&A um, are ones that actually apply the same focus, consistency, and really around the professionalism as they do with any other critical priority or discipline within the organization. And this generally requires probably four often what we would say neglected uh, capabilities. You know, the first is to engage in M&A thematically. The second would be to manage your reputation as an acquirer. That's extremely critical. Uh, confirm, obviously, your strategic vision. This all really starts on day one, which is, do you have a strategic vision, the strategic logic or rationale for the deal? And then finally, really managing the, energy, um, the synergy targets um, across the whole M&A life cycle. That doesn't mean at the very end, now putting thought into it, in essence, you're, once you are the, what I always like to say, the proverbial dog that caught the car, now what do you do? You should be thinking a lot about these, the synergy because quite obviously, many people engage in M&A because of the, some of the times the synergistic fit, obviously maybe on the revenue line, but more importantly, really around the cost line or the cost components. And that shouldn't be the, the last component to a, uh, when you do an integration to start thinking about how does this synergy work? So I would say that those are really the kind of the key principles as to why we often think about how we can be very helpful for obviously an acquirer uh, to engage in M&A. Great. So what inspired you to develop this m and course and what makes this one unique? So, I, you know, again, as I uh, had the pleasure of working in as a practitioner for nearly 25 years, um, working with uh, companies really throughout the world and private equity partners throughout the world on, on various types of transactions from very traditional buy side, sell side, uh, all the way through to what we would call um, shareholder activism assignments. And one of the things that becomes uh, very clear is there are a lot of headline grabbing deals that we often hear about, maybe on the merge, quote, merger Mondays that we talk about. And these are gonna be the multi-billion dollar deals that, of all the name brand companies we know. However, that's a very small portion of all the M&A that actually occurs. Uh, most often it occurs at companies uh, that are private companies and they're a lot smaller and they don't make the front page of the Wall Street Journal and probably don't even make the front page of their local newspaper, but they occur. And I would say that it's very important not only to get that right, clearly what some people would think of as a very large multinational M&A or what we call a merger of equals deal, as much as it is the same to do that at a very smaller company, all the things and principles are somewhat the same and you need to get those right. And so we wanted to find a way to make sure that we bring this uh, and make a program that we can get to people um, for companies at all different sizes um, that have all different levels of capabilities. Some people that are private company owners that want to sell and don't know where to start. And sometimes they're not really sure about picking up the phone and talking with a, a lawyer or a banker or someone else. This is a place for someone to come and feel comfortable, what I would say more of in a safe place to get a good idea about the building blocks around M&A obviously understanding the basics around valuation, the deal process, how the deal flow works, the deal process works, all the ins and outs. We'll walk you through not only all the important parts of the deal process, but including some very uh, critical, what I'd say M&A practitioner points along the way, not only starting in the deal, obviously around the legal documents from the NDA all the way to, to a purchase agreement. And one of the things that we certainly try to pride ourselves on here, um, and the reason we talk about this as far as bringing this from really about practice and academia, is we want to give you a, certainly a very strong grounding in the principles behind a lot of things we're doing. And they're going to be evidence-based and fact-based and making sure you understand some of the real core principles, obviously around other, whether it's valuation, the process and the like. What we also want to do, and we certainly recognize, is that there are also practitioner points that are very valid. So we're not only going to have our world-class faculty talk about some of the important points around this, we're gonna be bringing in world-class practitioners who are involved in M&A. So practitioners that are either bankers and lawyers uh, on the front end and also on the back end and everywhere in between. Uh, CEOs that actually go through and think about M&A as a strategic weapon in their arsenal. Uh, also the CFOs, gonna bring in board members or, and also business development um, people in, in their organizations that think about doing M&A all the time. 
and get their insights of how to actually apply this because application of this and the practitioner points are extremely crucial to make, to ensure obviously a successful deal. So one of the things that's kind of unique about this program is I think we're one of the only universities that in the area that offers this type of program. It is, and so uh, again, we're very fortunate that we have a, a community here in Dallas with a, a, a great um, you know, presence, I would say, both on the M&A side as far as practitioners and having a lot of our other local uh, banks, investment banks particularly, and also the law firms really engage and have some of their uh, best practitioners down here and willing to really support and work with us. Uh, and, our, and our faculty, again, I think is uh, obviously world renowned on a lot of disciplines. It's, it's pretty challenging sometimes to find, particularly in the uh, academic world, some faculty that spend a lot of time around, purely around M&A, let's say, or spend a lot of time around that because um, this obviously breaks across a lot of disciplines. And we're very fortunate also to have people partner with us in our law school because one of the reasons why, again, I, as I enjoy M&A is because it really is a confluence of a number of different di uh, disciplines. It really does start on the front end with strategy and the strategic vision of what you're, how to run a company and what you're planning on doing. And then you need to understand accounting and finance principles, some very key technical principles to ensure you're doing things properly. Uh, there's obviously a huge legal component because even day one, if you're go going to engage with somebody, what is the right way to document that through an NDA? What are the right things to put into an NDA? And there are some very important principles in there that can really affect the deal day one if you don't do this properly. So there's obviously a legal component as well. And then on the back end, it's really about ultimately people. And so when we're talking about integration and when we're talking about how to actually make a, a, a transaction work, this ultimately comes down to the human resource side and how to manage people. And it's really linking and pulling all of those together is really what, what going to make us a very successful transaction or not. Um, and part of along the way is making sure that we um, really, and this is where experience really does come in when talking with our practitioners, the communication piece of making sure that this is an integration all the way through and engaging in M&A thematically is extremely critical. And that's one of the things we'll walk through and show the really lay out those companies that do M&A and engage in M&A extremely successfully. And obviously we'll point out the ones that don't and you'll see a very clear con consistent pattern of what they're doing well and obviously the other ones and what they're not doing well. That's great. Well, that's a perfect segue into the program structure. <clears throat> so talk a little bit about this structure and how it builds out. Sure. So one of the things we wanted to do is make sure that there's uh, you know, very discreet, you know, clearly when we talk about mergers and acquisitions, it, it definitely can be very encompassing as far as what, what ultimately is, is happening here. So we really wanted to make sure we break this down into a number of different components uh, to, to, and bring in our practitioners, both on the acad or practitioners and also our, our, acad our academics to really give a lot of solid grounding. Think, of be think about these in kind of basic five, if you will, kind of various parts and then we have subcomponents, if you will. So the first part we always think of is just broadly the M&A environment. We want to talk about strategy, the strategic rationale for M&A, why companies are engaging M&A, who does it well, what are some of the motivations, how to look at synergies. Um, we'll talk a little bit about our, the regulatory considerations. It's very challenging to start on an M&A deal if you don't have at least the basic framework of some legal um, and regulatory framework that really underpins M&A. Um, for those interested around um, public M&A, and there are going to be many people I know already on this call that are, work at public companies, um, the public profile uh, is obviously very important, and that tends to deal with uh, the governance issues. Um, the next part is extremely crucial, which is the process. And we're going to really spend a lot of time talking about the buy side process, as well as the sell side process. So we'll talk about how a company can go out and look at doing acquisitions and create their own acquisition strategy how they actually engage in that and how they can think through all the different iterations. And then we're also going to do it from the sell side perspective. What do you need to do to be a, a very good seller? And then we'll obviously spend a lot of time on what is usually very critical for, any, for success of any deal, which is around the integration. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about the uh, post-closing and integration. Our faculty will spend uh, you know, significant time talking about the various valuation methodologies. Uh, very basically for everyone is that people have heard the discounted cash flow, but we'll move into what is very important, uh, particularly around M&A, more the M&A uh, valuation methodologies, which is merger consequences. If you're a public company, whether you have accretion dilution, 
We're going to talk about selling to a private equity participant, a private equity company. We'll talk about a, an LBO model, a leveraged buyout model, and what that really looks like. And we'll talk about the capital structure that's certainly involved when you're modeling that. And then we're, we're going to spend some time talking about the deal considerations. This is really the money issues. And these are truly economic issues, whether you get these right or not. And this is around accounting and tax. So we have our accounting and tax professionals spend a lot of time talking uh, around that. On the legal side, we'll spend definitely a lot of time making sure people understand the true important points around the legal issues. Um, we'll have some basic conversations around financing a transaction for those that are looking to raise some capital as part of that, whether it's both either uh, debt or equity or just obviously financing it through a debt, uh, most likely bank for private companies, and we'll talk through some of those. And then at the very end, we will talk about some of the other issues that are going on broadly in the environment. Um, those that are potentially looking at doing a transaction in a different jurisdiction or a different part of the world. And we'll give you some just basic frameworks of how to think about that in, a, uh, in an international context. So we tried to really make this very broad and holistic, giving everyone kind of a, a little bit of a touch. But, but this is, as, um, as people have probably seen, over really over four and a half to five days. So there's a lot of content. But the content is going to be supplemented very well with the practitioner insights. And that's really what I think makes this program very unique. Great. So let's talk a little bit about the faculty who are going to lead some of these topical areas. So again, we're very fortunate. So one of the things, as I said, why we are uh, very fortunate to be able to put this on at SMU uh, versus potentially some other schools is we have faculty, long tenured faculty, and actually department chairs and our senior associate dean and some others that have actually not only uh, spent a lot of time doing research in m, in m, in m a but more importantly, they've actually either ran businesses or actually have former bankers, or Russ Hamilton, who's uh, in our, one of our accounting, who's actually was a senior partner at Deloitte, um, actually doing m a integration and post-structuring. And on the negotiation side, we have uh, Robin Pinkley, who has actually spent her career looking, doing exactly this and advising companies um, on uh, very tough negotiations. So we're very, very fortunate that we have a faculty, and I don't mean just a junior faculty, but a very senior dedicated faculty that actually can spend time and give great insights uh, into this. That's great. And uh, Dr. Link, I think, is head of the finance department, and yes. Dr. Maxwell, also part of um, yes. the finance department, both very active in m as in their own. Um, yeah, both have spent a long time as, mm -hmm. um, in, as a, uh, practitioners themselves working on M&A deals, um, as well as obviously not only on the academic side, not only leading research, um, but obviously providing a lot of guidance as well. So we're very fortunate to have, like I said, a world-class faculty to be part of this. Right. And that's, that's very important to cover the academics, but that what makes it real is to have some industry practitioners. So tell us a little bit about these three that are participating in the program. Sure. So we've, um, again, we're very fortunate being obviously located uh, not only just in Dallas, but that's really irrespective of that because we can bring in our corporate partners from all over the world. Uh, but just even in our backyard, we actually are bringing in our partners from on the investment banking side from other Goldman Sachs, Evercore. Uh, on the corporate side with AT&T, PepsiCo, on the law firms from Gibson Dunn or McDermott, um, and then other corporate partners uh, from the consulting side, including McKinsey and Bain. And so we're able to bring in some great partners um, across the whole ethos, if you will, to lend a lot of practitioner insight. So Pete Michelson, who's the head of the um, activism and shareholder advisory unit at Goldman Sachs, uh, who is a colleague of mine, um, could obviously share a lot of insight around corporate governance issues. Margo, um, who spent a very long career um, up in the legal side, and, and obviously as a general counsel at a number of very large Fortune 500 companies, now serves on a number of corporate boards and very focused on M&A transactions as it relates to uh, companies from a board perspective. So we want to bring people into the boardroom and what's exactly happening in the boardroom during an M&A transaction. And uh, Bruce Shaw, who was a very long tenured uh, CFO for a Fortune 500 company who's uh, in the energy industry, um, grew a, a business um, almost tenfold in the energy industry, uh, can provide a lot of insight. What is it like to go through and have an acquisition strategy to grow and develop and again, do it extremely successfully over a course of 10 years and grow a tremendous business. So 
that's just a, a sample of those people. Um, but we're, again, very complimented from people from either the banks, the law firms, our corporate partners, and also from our consulting partners as well. Great. So I do have a question here, and it's about um, what's different about today's environment um, that's going to make an M&A transaction different? Sure. Well, there, there's certainly no doubt, actually, as uh, Sherry, uh, as you start off the call today, um, actually in February 20th of this year, we celebrated the 100th anniversary for business education at Cox, and that's obviously very exciting. Uh, three weeks later, as we all know, we were all basically uh, closed the campus, and we went to a, very, a virtual environment, at least for the, uh, the spring term. Uh, clearly, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a uh, you know, tremendous uh, effect globally, uh, but it's really been the kind of what I would say the uh, knock-on or the second order and probably third order effects that have really created a lot of dislocation in the world. Um, clearly, from an economic standpoint, from unemployment, from businesses have been disrupted. Um, when today, when what you think of as the uh, some travel industry businesses, or if you think of the, the hotel business and a number of others, it's a very different business environment today. Obviously, we're on Zoom today. If you everyone knows clearly that those businesses have done extremely well. Technology, as uh, obviously always an in, um, innovator and quite frankly a disruptor. This is going to be an environment for them to continue to do it. And so businesses are going to be extremely disrupted over the next probably five years as a result of this. I think you're going to see a change, obviously, in how we not only do our work, but how it's going to in impact and influence the workforce. It's going to change how we actually uh, our demographics to some degree. When I say demographics, I mean just our physical locations. People are going to work from home probably a lot more. Uh, that's going to have an impact in our in our communities because People aren't necessarily, and also probably in the commercial real estate, you won't need as large enough footprint as you did before. So all of these things actually create opportunity. When you create this opportunity, creates an opportunity to either, well, refocus your strategy, because one of the things we talk about in M&A, this all has to start first and foremost with your strategic vision and your alignment. You just don't buy and sell assets. It has to be, again, what's the strategic logic and rationale. So as this disruption is really occurring around us, and it is going to be, and it is occurring and will continue, what is your strategic plan going forward? Because your portfolio today of assets will be very different than today that in the next three, four, five years, what are you planning on doing? What are you planning on disposing or selling, if you will? So you're going to be probably selling some businesses or business lines. And then more importantly, what are you going to add? Now, some of these are definitely going to be probably organically grown. Um, but for those that uh, want to engage in inorganic growth, obviously through M&A, this, this environment is going to offer a lot of opportunities in that regard. Here's another question. Is there any added benefit in the uh, regulatory environment now or interest rates that make this time appropriate for M&A? Yeah, so generally right now, the, um, because we've been in a very low interest rate environment, for, I guess, for over 10 years, the financing is, it can be certainly done at a very compelling price. So again, if you're a public company and you're worried about, uh, again, what we call kind of this accretion dilution, uh, this financing world we live in today can obviously make that uh, certainly a lot more uh, palatable. Um, when there's dislocation though, quite frankly, and the more uncertainty, that does unfortunately lead to a lot more uncertainty in valuation. And that can actually be more challenging for deals because if you don't have to sell or you, let's say you don't have to engage in a transaction um, and you feel your business is worth a lot more than just the current market is valuing um, versus someone else who's looking at it because again, the uncertainty, that actually has a tendency to really, um, really be a, a headwind for transactions. Um, so the environment can obviously, and as we've always lived through these environments, there is no doubt the correlation to M&A activity really over the last 50 years does correspond with a lot of what's happening economically. And so as the, as the company or as the uh, GDP uh, certainly increases and as certainly the economic factors improve, so does M&A. And again, a lot of times because there's confidence. For, for an M&A deal to really occur, ultimately you have to have confidence in the, from the management team, the CEO, and in the boardroom. If they're not confident and they don't feel good about what's going on, they're not going to engage in M&A because they know that the likelihood of M&A just generally um, is, is tough. And if they don't have a sense of confidence, the likelihood of engaging in M&A is, is almost, uh, is, is very muted. Great. 
So maybe this is a good time to talk about how um, this program is going to be structured and pro programmatically and delivered. And I'm, now that we're in a COVID environment, um, I'll let Shane talk about that and how we may transition this program to be more of an online. Sure. So un until now, obviously, the last time we've, we've been able very fortunately to run these programs, we've always had them on campus in, purses, in person. Uh, this fall, for sure, um, we, de we intend to do it virtually. Um, you know, we thought long and hard now just and we are bringing a lot of our students back uh, to have an on campus in person experience. We're also offering it virtually for them as well that can't join us uh, for whatever reason. Um, but we wanted to ensure obviously given the timing that we were doing this in November that we want to deliver this program no matter what. And the best way that we know how to do that is going to be virtual. And when I talk about virtual, it won't necessarily just be purely simulcast, um, meaning that, you know, speaking one on one as we are kind of today face to face. We spent this summer, um, actually even longer than that, um, we've been very fortunate as a uh, institution to invest in our technological assets over the last two to three years um, for on campus delivery uh, for virtual delivery. And, and it's not just the technological assets, it's actually the human capital assets as well, because the big technology, quite candidly, is not that challenging. The human capital part, the adaptability on how to deliver this properly is, re is really the big change. Um, so we've worked over the summer with our other people, um, our M&A practitioners as well, to actually develop some of these modules where we can be able to deliver these seamlessly so you can have some of the content on your own at your own time. And then we'll come together and do some application uh, in the classroom, if you will. Um, and so we're going to try to bring a, a way of giving people a, a balanced approach where they can have access to content and delivery beforehand, and then come together and actually learn together um, in, in a classroom environment. And we still plan on doing that over that week-long period. Um, but we'll try to we'll schedule it out to give people enough time in between. But we also want to make sure there's plenty of time for our industry practitioners to come in and add their salient points and comments as well. So we're not going to minimize any of the true value add as far as the content uh, in any way, um, but we are going to make sure that we do deliver it and we deliver the content and the impact and the engagement as highly as possible. Right, and I think our reach could be even farther, um, not only with the speakers that can come in, but uh, as well as some of the participants, which always adds the richness to the conversations. It does, and so I think for, for us now, the, the, the ability to actually, uh, as you just said, Sherry, we can probably bring in um, a whole different uh, group of people that may have not had the opportunity to travel to join us on, in, on campus or in person in that Dallas at that time frame. We will make it available so they can at least join us uh, virtually from wherever they are. Right, that's great. So let's talk a little bit about who should apply for this program. And maybe Shane, you can start us by talking about who, um, who was the, the type of candidate that came into the program the last time we ran it. So we had a number of different people uh, join, but you know, I'd definitely say for those at uh, companies today, uh, certainly an established company, those have, and maybe leadership teams, we've had people who are board members. Um, private company owners, quite candidly, are a good rich source uh, because at some point, they are always thinking of either growing their business or quite candidly, maybe even selling their business. And they're not always sure who to talk to. And so uh, coming to a course like this and being in a classroom or being part of a group of people that are thinking the same way, obviously in the same journey that you are on perhaps, which is, are they going to grow their company uh, inorganically or are they thinking of selling the business? And then engaging with us, um, learning some more about thinking about the valuation, thinking about the process, and really understanding what lies ahead has been a very uh, good source of, uh, I think, for, for those individuals, it's been an extremely rich and rewarding environment. Uh, a number of corporate directors have joined us because sometimes they join a board. They may have very unique skills and why they're joining a board, but perhaps in along their way, they've not really engaged in uh, M&A. Clearly, that's a skill set that anyone on a board should definitely have. Um, anyone usually in the, the CFO um, or finance director, if again, if they've not had a lot of experience uh, doing m and um, this has been a, a very good, uh, and also for those who are younger in their career, they're uh, perhaps a business analyst. We've had a couple of those that are trying to transition in their career internally. They weren't leaving their company. They wanted to join the business development team. But what they wanted to do is get a set of skills and, and uh, obviously leverage that 
so they can pull that into their business development opportunity. That's great. So um, I do have another question here. Um, you talked a little bit about valuation techniques, net present value and things. Um, can you go into a little more detail about um, the types of valuation processes you use and is there anything new on the horizon? Sure. So we um, will obviously make sure that everyone understands certainly the basic framework that everyone usually generally applies when they're thinking about M&A, which is to think about it as, um, and also it depends on kind of really what position you're in, whether you're actually selling the company or buying it. And so we'll give you a lot of the, the tools that you'll need around that. We'll make sure that you understand the basic tools and frameworks from either a DCF, what we call relative valuation. So either whether it's through comparable companies, so taking companies or peer companies, um, and also what we say we call precedent companies. So these are transaction comps, if you will, companies that have actually been bought and sold and obviously the uh, same industry, same size. Uh, there are a number of different ways of looking at a merger model. So what does that look like when you take the two companies together and combine them? What we're gonna try to make sure though is not just walk you through the mechanics because that's quite easy to be honest. I mean, it, it might sound hard at first when people go, I've never done it, but the real insight is around the adjustments you make when you're thinking about pro forma financials. When I say pro forma, it's like, what does this business look like once you've acquired it? Are you making the right changes to your business um, on the synergy line? What are you thinking about for synergies? What are the right synergies? Do you get any credit for revenue synergies? Um, should you even be counting on those? And so we're gonna spend a lot of time thinking about the nuts and bolts of how to actually lay out the financials and then talk about how to do the, the, uh, the valuation as well. Great, thank you. Okay, so as we uh, begin to wrap up here, um, let's talk a little bit about our fall calendar that we offer here in executive education. Um, we have four main themes that we focus on. We focus on leadership, we focus on finance, we focus on strategy, and we focus on multi-dimensional uh, diversity. And so in September, we're kicking off with uh, three of our fundamental programs. Uh, Transformational Leadership begins on September 8th. Uh, Rising Latino Leaders is a program out of our uh, Latino Leadership Institute, and it's um, part of two programs that we offer at mid-level and senior level Latino supported leadership. And then we have a Fundamentals of Management program that begins on September 15th. And in October, we have three programs, um, that are targeted strategy programs and one leadership program. So we're starting with leading change in volatile times. And this is just a one day program that really helps refocus your strategy and where we are now. Um, October 5th is Women in Leadership, uh, a new program we're launching this year. And October 6th is Master Negotiation with uh, Dr. Robin Pinkley. And in November is the program we're talking about today, Mergers and Acquisitions. Um, and it will be over that same week, although as we mentioned, it will be a different format than maybe you're seeing on the website today, but um, will be offered virtually. And then we're doing Building the Intelligent Enterprise. This is also a new program we're offering this year to help companies understand where they are in the data integration process. And when you're looking down the road 10 years, what's coming and how you prepare your organization for understanding analytics, big data with artificial intelligence and machine learning built into all those variables. And year round, we are offering uh, custom programs where we take these topics and go directly to a company and develop a program that meets their needs for their leadership development going forward. And so that's just a look at our calendar there. I'm just making sure I don't have a question here. Um, let's see. So at this point, if you do have questions, I want to mention that um, you could reach out to either one of us, to Dr. Goodwin or to myself, about any of our programs that we offer, as well as uh, if you wanted to have a deeper conversation about how your professional development needs might match some of the programs that we're offering, um, or any specific questions you have about merger and acquisitions, we would love to hear those as well. And Shane, if there's anything else you wanted to talk about as the highlights of this program um, while people are either sending in questions or just winding down, that'd be great. Now, uh, first of all, just thanks everyone for uh, attending today. Um, again, hopefully you'll find this uh, very interesting. We've, uh, as I said, we're very fortunate to have a great faculty and uh, practitioners that are willing to help us put together a great program. And I uh, thank you, Sherry, for obviously hosting us today. Yeah. 
Well, thank you all for joining us. We had a good attendance on today's program and we do hope to see you in upcoming programs. As I mentioned, um, you know, they will be both in person and virtual. So we will see you either virtually or in person in the fall. And uh, thank you again for joining us today. Take care.